Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with modern-day drummer Matt Wilson. Over the course of our conversation, he discussed a very long, adventurous jazz journey that he has penned thus far. On the heels of a new Christmas album, he talked about a gig at the White House, interviewing Dave Brubeck, playing with many legends over the years, what projects are on the horizon, along with much, much more. Dig this interview, my friends. So let me go ahead and dive right in here. and Let me get an idea of what has been going on with you lately. Let's see. Uh, well, I just came from my basement. Uh, no, um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, we're gearing up for this Christmas trio tour. Uh, yeah, we from today actually in uh, Co- uh, at the Coamo Jazz Center in um, in Santa Cruz, and we go from there up to Northern California and uh, to Arcata, uh, to the Redwood Jazz Alliance, and then down to the Mondavi Center for four nights, and then to SF Jazz for a couple of days, and then up to Seattle Jazz Alley for a couple of nights, and then Vancouver. And we come back and we do St. Louis the following week, uh, week for four days. And we come back here and do two nights at the Jazz Standard uh, in New York City with um, Jason Moran as our guest and um, various other uh, New York luminaries will, I'm sure, show up and uh, sing and play with us. So it's always fun. And uh, I just made I made a new record that we um, just approved the mastering for this morning. It comes out in March and it celebrates my 20th year with Palmetto Records along with um is dedicated to the memory of my wife so it's a it's a kind of a big picture record it's um it's it's basically everybody who's recorded with me all the groups sort of put together so it's 13 musicians in total some of which are playing all at the same time so it's it's um Kurt Kanefke and Charles Stafford and Jeff Letterer and Joel Fromm and Andrew D'Angelo and Gary Versace and Larry Goldings and three bassists, uh, Matt uh, uh, Martin Wind, Paul Sakivi, and Yosuke Inoue provides a, uh, a bass solo from Japan. It's really different. Yeah, it sounds like it. it sounds yeah, like it's, gonna it's called. It sounds. It's going to be called the beginning of a memory, and I'm just calling that that ensemble like the uh, Big Happy Family because it's that's sort of what it is. So, and it was remarkable, and we did all of this. Rec- the basic tracks, which were eight of us, um, the, all the horns and two basses, and I. Uh, Joe, we did it all. We did 17 tunes in five and a half hours. Wow! And um, and it was done without arrangements, meaning we're lead sheets, tunes that we had recorded before, and 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 one new one that's dedicated to Felisa. But otherwise, um, there it's just that's it. I mean, those just react in truly organic, you know, ensemble playing. And there's different combinations. Like there's a piece that's just the horns. There's a piece that's just the basses, so it's not you know, it's, and there's a quintet or you know, there's some smaller groups within it, but there's quite a few of these that are you know, kind of the two D ensemble. So uh, I'm very very grateful to to have had the opportunity to do this. So it's hard to gather everybody at one time. We got close, you know, but it's just impossible with everyone's schedules and you know. But I was lucky to get all, all you know, the priority was to get all the horns together. You know? But it was really great to record with multiple basses, you know. So that's nice to pull. Yeah. Absolutely. And then Chris came in, like Cap came in and and played brilliantly on stuff on some electric and some effects. And then um, Gary Versace is just genius, you know, so he came in and recorded a bunch of you know with bunch on bunch of tunes either on organ or piano or accordion, and um, just sounds amazing. I mean, so yeah, it's it's and there's a little you know it's pretty it's it's uh, like a movie. That's what um, when we sent to uh, A.T. Michael McDonald, which is kind of funny. We 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 kind of did a lot of things kind of back where Pat Rustasy, who used to work for Palmetto, was there and cook like in the old days. And and My, Michael A.T. Michael McDonald mastered this one. He hasn't mastered the last few records, so it's kind of nice to bring back all of the family in a way overall. So we did it. Yeah, we did that in August and did some of the overdub sessions in September and mixed it and now it's mastered. So. I'm really excited about about right that, on. and and I've been doing some new groups, and uh, I'm very proud father this morning because my my daughter was um, uh, re- played Reno Sweeney and Anything Goes last weekend, and and uh, the lead in Anything Goes, and she was just amazing. So, kind of still uh, basking in that. Well, you know, the thing that always amazes me when I hear about you know you squeeze that many songs in a five and a half hour window, I always hear Radiohead's going in the studio, and they're going to be in there for like six months, and they're going to do ten songs. But when I hear you jazz cats get in there, it's like you're an immediate, well-oiled machine, and it's magic from the word go, you know? Yeah, well, thank you. And I, you know, I always do these pretty quickly. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I don't spend too much time. We, we, we did a, you know, we do a setup day, so that helps. You know, we set up, I, I try to, what I try to do, Joe, is schedule the night before, set up, get sound. So we, basically, the other thing that surprises me about this is the night before, four of us went out for the setup. So that was Martin and I, Kirk and Andrew. So we set up, got sounds, had dinner, and we went out and actually improvised the record. So we're actually going to mix and master that and, and um, have that be another possibility. I mean, those usually, for me, don't always go, per se, but this particular group and the way it felt, it, it really is very compositional and very flowing, so we're going to work on that, too. So, like, I need more to do. Actually, Kirk is, I think Kirk has kind of taken that one over a little bit as far as, like, finding some, a home for it, so that'll be nice. And, and the one thing that I want to bring up, which is very recent, is this newest Christmas album. Talk a little bit about how this came about. Well, the Christmas trio started, actually, Six years ago, we there was a concert series in Brooklyn that invited me to do a concert, and you know Kirk was gone, and Lightcap was gone, and Martin Wynn was gone. So, you know, I decided, well, we, we uh, Jeff and I, we'd done Christmas gigs in the past with the quartet back in the day, you know, a few places around New York detour, and, and so I said, well, it's December, let's do this. So I remember, I remember the day very, very well, and Paul had been out with uh, with us that fall um, with the Christmas trio. I decided to assemble that, and then when it was just the three of us and we're playing Christmas tunes, Trio came to mind, uh, T R E E uh, dash O, and which Pat Metheny recently told me when we were playing together that he thought that was the greatest band name ever. Um, <laughs> uh, we 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 did it, and then it went really well, and and there were some clips of it on YouTube and such. So. Pat Rusty and other folks in Palmetto called me at the time and said, you know. Why don't we do a Christmas record? And so I, I thought about it. Yeah, it'd be fun. So in May of 10, um, we, we, we made this record and, um, it was really fun. And again, we did this one really fast too. And, um, so it came out in the, in, in December of 10. And since that time, you know, each year we, we play and we, this year we, we have 16 dates. We're calling it the 16 days of Christmas tour across North America. So we, we have a lot of dates, and um, and and we're really we're pulling out all the stops. We made a couple short films that we'll show during the set. Uh, one is a spoof of uh, "It's Wonderful Life," which um, uh, Jeff is Mr. Potter, and then we do um, one of um, a Christmas story where the young you know Ralphie wants the BB gun, but in this case Ralphie wants the Matt Wilson Christmas Trio CD, and everybody's cautioning him that he'll burn his ears out if he listens to that music. <laughs> We've kind of got this regular, you know, annual event at the Jazz Theater where we play and we have a guest. So, you know, we've had Jason before and Bill Frizzell, and uh, and then people come by. Joe Lovano's come by, Esperanza Spalding's come by and sang, and Cecile McCorn Savant came by and sang last year, and Kurt Elling comes every year, and this year Sasha Vasandani is going to come by, and Chris Bergson and and Janice Siegel and and uh, Duchess has sang with us and. And uh, so it's really, yeah, it's it's a it's kind of become a, like an annual jazz you know tradition here in New York City. So we're proud about that too. So it's fun. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. The irony of it all, or maybe it's not irony. It's just that wow, the music is really great, and the playing is top. I mean, I think it's not only just some of the hippest Christmas music. I think it's just some of the swinging as hip as jazz. So a wide array, and we're adding a bunch of tunes this year. We've got some new ones and. And um, we try to avoid a couple, but when people come and sing with us, we do those. But we, you know, we, um, yeah, we've added a Puerto Rican one for this year and um, and a couple other ones. So it's, yeah, we try to add, you know, with the films and we've just got matching red blazers, velvet blazers that are like really hip. Yeah, sweaters. So it just depends, you know, it's great. I mean, we really, yeah, we're really trying to have as much fun as possible with it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, Let's take this elevator down to the beginning of your life here, and let okay. me find out where were you born and raised, and what was your childhood like to give you this love of jazz and music. I was born in West Central Illinois, uh, Knoxville is the town. It's near Galesburg, kind of halfway between Peoria and the Quad Cities. I was born in you know the '60s, '64. So I was, you know, there was, uh, I saw music on television. I was born with a uh, club foot, so I had a lot of cast on my legs. So one of the ways. That my mom would entertain me was the turntable. We had the stack turntable, you know, the console with the stack. So my mom could put on, you know, four LPs and get it worked on, you know, or be close. But and she'd put stuff around me. She her her claim about my affinity or 
um, drawing to the drum set was that I couldn't move around a lot. I, I, you know, so I was in one place. So she would play stuff around me, and that's how I played. So she always thought that the, the you know, that that was one of the reasons I was drawn to the drum set. I think mom was pretty wise in that, you know, regard. So, and the music was great. She put on mar, you know, we had like a record of these marches, and I liked and um, and other records, and so that was uh, sort of a. I heard the music and I really liked it. And my brother and I, uh, my middle brother and I, sort of portray songs. You know, we we get records and then we learn them and then act them out. You know, people come over and we would do like, you know, we would be the songs from the Jungle Book or we had this Ray Stevens record and you know, <laughs> I look back and I see where the progression comes. You know, and then my brother, my brother's five years older, my middle brother, so he he started playing saxophone in, in junior high. I started, I saw the, I saw drums really like the drum set. On television a lot, but then I I saw the Lucy Show uh, after uh, one time the the seventies early seventies Lucy Show and Buddy Rich was a guest on there and was judging a drum contest and so you can see this episode actually on YouTube it's pretty amazing and so I that's when I saw it and I I became that's when I really got into it I mean it's like second grade it made it really hit me I was like well, I really dig this and my I had a friend in high school in, in junior high and high school well I met in grade school actually but we were friends throughout but it, later in in that time period late late elementary school we'd hang out and he had records and we'd listen to records we I'd bring records we listen to records and his parents belonged to this record club and so by chance probably because there was drums on the front they ordered a buddy rich max roach record called rich versus roach on mercury records with arrangements by Gigi Grice and Phil Woods was on the record and Julian Priester and John Bunch. I mean, you know, both of their bands were represented. Jimmy Cobb was actually at the at the date. Jimmy told me that um, when we were teaching together. And I heard Max and it just totally, you know, I can remember the day it totally changed, you know, my, that's what I wanted to do. I mean, I really heard that way of, of approaching the instrument and I was hooked. So Very cool. uh, that's sort of a part. And then, you know, the, the then it just kept elevating from there. You know, I would go see a lot of people, that same friend of mine, and I would go see anything that was near. So one week, one time, uh, Joe, we went to one town north and saw Clark Terry. And we went to one town uh, south and saw Dizzy with his quartet. And then we went to um, Champaign and saw um, Urbana and saw Oscar Peterson solo. Yeah, right? So yeah. this was in you know, 80, 80, 81. And then Louis Belson would come around a lot. So I would see Mr. Belson and talk with him and he was always very encouraging and so I had a lot of yeah my parents would take me to everything and I was you know I'm blessed I'm really blessed for that aspect of things so clinics we saw you know I would go to clinics all over the place and camps and et cetera, et cetera. so yeah it was great so I got you know I got into a, a lot of things very very early on and was pretty serious about it I had some great teachers private teachers and high school teachers and and I had a great college experience and I did major in jazz thankfully by my major in percussion I don't mean that in a bad way but uh but yeah I, I you know we had a lot of things coming through I went to school at Wichita State so the festival was big and we I got to meet a lot of people there who we have still my friends or you know who I've, I've since got to play with so even so that's pretty amazing too so yeah it's been a great journey and then lived in Boston my wife did her master's at NEC so we lived there from 80 we got married in 87 we lived there from 87 until 92 and then we moved to New York so I've been here ever since so. what was it finally like to get to that mecca of New York to to you know that's obviously the cradle of jazz after all those years in, in the Midwest what was it like to go there the pace of life what you saw and how you kind of got into the music scene well you know we were in Boston for five years prior so it kind of introduced us a little bit to you know, a larger um, scene. I was very active there and remained very active there even within my first few years, uh, through a pretty good period of the first few years here in New York. I was in a band called The Either Orchestra, which is still in existence, which in December celebrates its 30th year. So, you know, I was in that band with John Modeski and, you know, Andrew D'Angelo and Doug Yates and John Carl. I mean, you know. And so that band was playing and traveling. And then through Russ Gershon, the leader of that band, who's a genius, he has a record label. So I started playing a lot of records for people that were making records for that label. So that was nice. And then Charlie Coy's had a band that started was traveling a lot. So um, it was nice to play play a lot there. So when I came to New York, you know, I had already known a bunch of people through those travels. And, and it seemed like there was, a, as there always is, there's a migration to hear um, quite regularly of generations of players. So when I got here, it was, 
you know, 92, and there was a lot going on, and there were still, it was still a little bit, there was still a lot of little smaller places, and, and the mini factory scene was big, and uh, so that was fun, and I, you know, I, I immediately, I was here, and I got, I immediately got into some nice things, and playing a lot of sessions, and, you know, meeting people that are, and playing with people that are, you know, now, you know, Dave Douglas, and David Berkman, and, all, you know, the list goes on and on, and, of folks, and eventually I started playing, I was in Cecil McBee's band, and then Dewey Redmond heard me play in Boston, and asked me to join his band, so I started, I started playing with him in about, well, it'll be 20 years ago, that's pretty amazing, and, um, and I played with him from, uh, from uh, two th- 1994, it'll be 21 years actually, 1994 till he died in, in 2006. So um, that was a great period, you know, yeah, of, yeah. of music for me, you know, of playing with Dewey and traveling a lot and playing with other folks and Lee Konitz, who I'm still playing with a lot and, you know, have been with for years. So, yeah, and, and so, and, and then, you know, I, I got a chance to record, which I did in 1996, so that's why this record's coming out in 16 and with Palmetto, and so I've been 20 years with them. I wasn't really looking for that at that point, but when it, you know, it came to me and it was fantastic. So, um, so that's when I sort of started that world and, and band leading, and now I have all these projects, and I've started some new ones recently. I have a band of some young musicians that I'm really proud of, and here, and then I have one also one in Europe, and so it's nice to have um, those possibilities. You know, it's, I've been really fortunate. To play, to apprentice with a lot of great people, you know, Dewey, Cecil, Charlie Hayden, Lee Konitz, Andrew Hill, you know, Denny's Island, Buster Williams, I mean, the, the, Joe Lovano, I mean, Schofield, I mean, all these people like that. And then, you know, people in between that I, you know, play with a lot, Ray Anderson and Myra Melford and Mark Dresser and et cetera, et cetera, Jane Ira Bloom, and then my peers and then now the younger generation. So I'm really, I'm very fortunate. I try to immerse myself in each of those, you know, kind of simultaneously still, you know, I, any opportunity I get to play with any, any one of those groups, I, of groups of people I do, you know, so it's fun. Yeah. So pretty much from the word go, you have been kind of around high caliber people, what we would consider jazz stars and really celebrated people. What, what has that education been like? I mean, you got a formal education in the classroom but it seems like you've been worked over pretty well with the real world with being around these people. What is it like to be around um, that caliber? Now that these younger cats are coming up, you're in that echelon of, of you know, j- jazz star status. What is that whole circle like for you? Well, well, that's that's flattering. Thank you. Um, really, I didn't move to New York until I was 27. So, I mean, I was doing mostly, I play, I've always played with older musicians, even when I was a kid. I was drawn to the, that music, and so I was playing with older musicians. So, and in Boston, it became more, it was a little bit more of a peer group vibe, which I think was great at that point because you learn a lot from your peers. I mean, you know, you, you really do, like about music and about recordings and et cetera, et cetera. So that was really actually very hip. And I and, and sort of had to seek out uh, more of the older musicians in Boston. But when I got here, you know, it, it just become, it became, you know, uh, and then through all kinds of circumstances. But it, they they teach. That's really where you learn. I mean, and so that's why I'm wanting to do this now with with um, young musicians. The ones I, the group I have are either one is a graduate graduate from the new school, but two are still presently students there. They're both the, the two younger ones are 19. You know, they're young, and and it's nice to present them because I really believe in them, and to give them the opportunity to to, to play and have people hear them for myself i learned a lot about presentation i learned a lot about behavior <laughs> you know i learned a lot about you know people who are positive i've always been around very fortunate people that are really um not only remarkable musicians and performers but really amazing human beings so you know you learn a lot about how to be and 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 in certain cases how not to be but uh by experiencing other you know aspects of it but but through all those instances you know it's always a learning experience and i'm I'm grateful for each and every one of them, and I've been really for- happy too to to know like with the you know quartet, for example, or uh, Christmas trio, or even arts and crafts to a certain extent to have put a bands together now of where these musicians are all you know uh, highly regarded as all stars. I mean, I was one of the first people to ever bring you know Chris Lightcap out on the road, or Kurt Kanuffke, or or Paul Sakivi, you know, you know, and and. And now these guys are all, you know, 
everybody knows who they are. So, you know, that's a nice feeling that I had. I, I, I'm not saying I was responsible by, by any stretch of the imagination, but if I had anything to do with it, I, I'm extremely proud of that. So that's nice, too. Well, speaking of being involved in things, it was interesting when you were at the uh, artist residence at the Litchfield Jazz Fest, you got to speak and interview Dave Brubeck. What was that experience like? Wow, you know, that was a... You know that was a, a, a human experience that you know you'll never forget. I'm a very, a, a very allegiant to the music, and I try to serve the music in, in as many different ways as I can. So, for example, you know, as a as a player, uh, first and foremost, but really as a teaching artist, you know, I'm really active. As uh, I'm, I'm now, uh, tra- I'm curating and artistic director of a series at the Tillis Center here on Long Island. We just presented our first concert of that series, which was Bill Charlap's trio with a workshop and a, and a pre-concert talk with Bill. And then, you know, people right up close, you know, and then we have, a, you know, two more concerts in that series. Started launching another little home, you know, house concert series here in my town with a friend. So, you know, I'm trying to do as much as I can to, to serve the music. So in this case, when I was asked to be this artist in residence, that... At the Detroit Jazz Festival, one of the things I find find fascinating is they have a, tent, a talk tent and they interview folks. And so, I when I when Vita Muir um, approached me about this, I was like, "Well, I'd really like to, you know, incorporate this aspect of it because I feel like people want to know more than about the folks at times than just what they experience from the bandstand, and they'll be more connected to those folks if they hear stories. I mean, life is really about stories anyway. So if you get a chance to hear. A great artist like Mr. Brubeck, or I also did the same thing with Mr. Roy Haynes and Mr. Jimmy Heath and Joe Lovano and Vijay Iyer and Mario Pavone over the two years that I did that. When you hear stories and you hear their human aspect of their lives, you become more connected to them. So I think we're, you know, I think it helps create uh, more fans. It helps create more um, connected fans, and, and thus you're creating more community. So I think anything we can do to help the community uh, aspect of it, I'm very dedicated to. Yeah, that uh, it was powerful. And and he was fun. You know, he was great. And I found some great subjects. You know, I did research, but, you know, as an improviser, you know, you improvise, you go with what's going on. He was so easy to talk to, and I, um, and he was, re- I mean, it was brilliant. You know, and I asked him some different, I believe, some different kinds of questions, and he was intrigued. And, um, yeah, he was, uh, it, yeah, that's a, I look at every time I see that picture, I really go like, wow, that was great. Absolutely. That would be cool. Let me ask you this. You know, of all the things that you've done, that, that's a pretty cool thing. There's been so many places that you've been to. You got to play uh, for President Obama at a state dinner at the White House. What was that like? Well, there's another one. You know, there's another instance where, you know, you get an opportunity like that, and, you know, it 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 yields a lot of stories that you can keep for yourself for the rest of your life or share. I mean, basically what I do is share them. But it was great having an opportunity I've never played with, Mr. Hancock before, Herbie Hancock, so that was fun, and Diane Reeves and Dee Dee Bridgewater, and I got to meet four presidents, and yeah, and it was pretty powerful. You know, you could, uh, the the thing about playing at the White House is you can tell folks, you know, you play at the Village Vanguard, or you can uh, say this or that, but you say the White House, pretty much everybody knows the White House. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, uh, it knows what that's like, and it was it was really fun. It was It was really fun, and I was a you know, definitely uh, a treat and uh, to meet the president and to have him announce my name. And, you know, I kissed the first lady on the cheek. And, you know, that was very pleasant. So it was a nice experience. It was great. It was really fun. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that's interesting, some months back, I went to the Mutual Musicians Foundation here at KC. And, you know, Charlie Parker, Art Blake, I mean, the doors have been open to every single jazz musician you can think of that's gone through the door. And a paranormal crew went through there and they monitored activity. And they left kind of freaked out because they were like, oh, my God. And I know when I walk into the foundation, I'm like, wow, it's like a warm handshake and warm. Yeah. It's, it's really, you can feel the bumping of the invisible souls that once pulsated in there. So my question is this. I'm always curious when musicians get to go into the White House. Do you feel that kind of weight of history in there? Is there a good general feeling? What do you feel when you're in the White House? Um, yeah, you know, no, definitely. And. It's small, you know, you don't, it's really not that big. And, you know, the, the East Room, you know, where you play, it's really small. And I was marveled by, once we got in, you know, we were kind of, it was a, it was loose a little bit. You know, I mean, we weren't monitored, you know, all the time. I, I didn't know that we were in, there was some room that we were waiting in, you know, in the afternoon before a soundtrack or something. And Randy Brecker, 
who I just love, um, sat down in some chair and, and there was a Secret Service guy there pretty quickly to tell him that that chair was from like the 1700s and no one's allowed to sit in it. <laughs> you know, it was like, I don't know, somebody's chair. But, you know, they were cool about it. They were, they were, they were nice. You know, they didn't like, you know, tackle him or anything. They just said, sir, um, you know, we can't allow you to sit there. But, you know, I was fine with everything until I, there was the only thing that made me a little nervous was they said, um, right before we went on, somebody came from the Secret Service that said, um, if we have to stop, we'll go like this, and that means you stop. You don't play another note. That means we got to get the president out because of you know something. So, you know that's you don't hear that you know backstage uh, at very often. You know, they, no. you know. So, and then people were really close. You know, President Clinton and Secretary Clinton were right in front of me, and the Carters, you know, like right, right, right in front of, right, right in front of me. You know, basically. So yeah. It was great to to play and like look up and see you know those people digging it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we had a good history of presidents really dig jazz. I mean, here in Kansas City at the uh, KC Jazz Museum, Bill Clinton sax is there, so you know his brains in jazz mode. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, he's yeah. a one of the great. You know, I I've met him. You know, a couple times prior, and so so I know. I mean, I saw him. We, we played a, an event one time. I played an event uh, for the UN and uh, with. Ted Nash and Winton and Marcellus and uh, Ben Allison, and, and it was really fun. And and he spoke, and it was like one of the greatest solos I've ever heard. You know, really, I mean, it was just a case of like, you know, he he read a little bit, then the glasses came off, and he just spoke, and we're just like riveted. So, uh, and then one time after Arts and Crafts played the Kennedy Center, we we um, we hung out. He was at a bar that we were at at a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked to him again for a little bit. It was great. Yeah, he was great. He was, you know, he was nice. He was very yeah. hip. He came through the Truman Museum here, and I saw him. And when that door opened up, and he came in, it was like all of the air was pulled out of us. And yeah. When he went in. I have never, in an oratory sense, seen someone orchestrate magic. I mean, he's like Harry Potter up there. You're just like, wow, wow. It's like once you start digesting one segment of his oratory. He hits you with a frying pan with another one. You're just trying to keep up, and you're like, wow, yeah. Just- we I met the president of China, and I met President Obama, and 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 I played a wedding years ago for a Bush nephew up in New Hampshire or something. So I met Bush Senior, and so I mean, you know, whatever po- politics aside, I don't really want to get started. But you know, just meeting someone who's been in that position at all is a powerful experience. Yeah. You know, so and he was he was actually a very extremely warm. He was really extremely nice guy and really warm. You know, there was another great Secret Service story at that one too. But I mean, he was a former president. I need I was band leading actually. I was sort of charged, so we could, we needed an extension cord for the Hammond organ and um, and the caterers had kind of used up all the outlets. So we needed this cord. So Secret Service guy comes over and says, you know, what do you need? I said, well, we need an extension cord to go from here to there. And he just whispered something into like a little microphone. And next thing we knew, we had a cord. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so you sense their 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 charisma that they have and their ability to to really you know Joe Lovano's like that you know I mean Joe Lovano's the Bill Clinton of the saxophone I mean he really just has that kind of charisma you know and and I admire that so you know you like I said Dewey had that you know Charlie Hayden you know I mean you know you, again you you seek out those kind of folks that really lift you all the way around so. It, and in that case, those guys lifted me, and they allowed me to be myself. Somebody just asked me about that. What was it like being with those guys and playing with those guys? And it was like they, what they did is allowed me to be myself. So, what I'm doing with these young musicians is allowing them to be themselves. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to make them something that they're not, or or make them, you know, tell them what to do. I'm just trying to guide them, you know, and say, hey, let's play this music, and I'm going to let you go. And they bring in music that I had to practice, you know, because it's like, I'm not familiar with it. So I had to learn, you know, I had to learn to play some of these tunes because it's a little bit different for me. So that's fun too. I new challenges. You know, I'm not going to sit around and, and, and go like, well, you know, the stuff these guys are doing, I don't you know. You know, I, I'm going to learn it. You know, so I learned it. And it was really fun to improvise over this form that I'm not used to. So, you know, again, we were always are always wanting to welcome new challenges. And, and in, the, in this case, you know, these young folks you know, are doing it. My peers too. I mean, it's, it's all the way around. You know, I don't really, you know, separate. You just want to be around people that, but trust you and you trust them. I mean, the that that is the thing I think that though that all those leaders that, that I described, you know, have done for me. They trusted me, you know. Dewey trusted me and Charlie Hayden trusted me, you know, Lee Conus trust me, Joe Lovano trust me, you know. Tom Skillfield. I mean, like that that's a kind of a nice feeling that they, they trust somebody I just read that a 
the, the team is not just the people that can work together. Teams are people that can trust each other. Yeah. So, you know, when you have that kind of level of trust on the bandstand, um, uh, on the bandstand and off too about just ideas, concepts, then, then, then I think you're really, that to me is a sign of, wow, you're, you, you've tapped into something really powerful. Absolutely. Well, speaking of powerful, we've, there's been a lot of names, a lot of people that you play with. Who would you say has taught you the most about not only just music, but life? I think my wife taught me a lot about life, actually. And, right. can you know, I mean, uh, yeah, because, you know, we were married for a long time. We have four. We, you know, we gave, we brought four beautiful kids in the world. We, we, and we, you know, we grew up together. We met in college and, and, and we took, we took experiences from each of our lives from both, you know, I could say my father and mother, but, you know, her folks are just as important and, and and Dewey was important, you know. One of my sons' his middle names is Dewey. You know, I mean, there's all these people that have been really, uh, uh, really important. You know, I think it's all about the community. I mean, if you, you know, when I was just home, I was just back in Illinois doing a residency at a college in you know, my hometown, and then the quartet came out. And when I played this concert, I had my second grade teacher was there, my seventh grade English teacher was there, my high school band director was there. And uh, my high school humanities teacher was there. And another English teacher, eighth grade English teacher was there. So, you know, each of those people have a, a play a part. I mean, without any, it's all, it, to me, it's all a puzzle. And, and, and how those people fit into that framework is, is shapes of who you are. So, you know, I think maybe the best answer to that is is just positivity is the best teacher because you get people that guide you and give you that kind of support then it's really really great i mean there's been certain people for certain things you know but uh overall i can't really fortunately i or fortunately or unfortunately i can't really say oh this person did it because without the people prior i wouldn't have had the ability to take in what he was offering or what you know what charlie you know, or you know i mean you know it's any number of of of, uh, so that's why I encourage young folks to remain curious and be open and try to experience as much as possible. You know, try to get out. If I can inspire students to just want to know, then I've done something. You know, I mean, it's, information is one thing, or oh, here's how you do this, or you play this. But the whole point of that, this is, is if you, you know, you, the learning continues. So if you can inspire people to still continue to learn and be open, then then I think as a teacher, you've you've done something. And those teachers that I described were all part of that you know that yeah. second grade teacher came at the right time the private teacher i had came at the right time you know john larson or you know getting this nea grant to say with ed self came at the right time you know i mean i've got, done a couple commencement speeches I did one of the new school and for their commencement a couple of years ago in wichita states a few years ago and i don't like the term good luck because that just means you know but you create your own good luck you know you don't you don't you you create that so, you know, that's what I inspire them to try to do. You do all these things, you be, you be a kind person, you be a good citizen, cultural citizen, you be a good member of the community, things are going to happen if you can really play, <laughs> you know, right. first and foremost. If you have something to say and you can play and, you, and you're a good person, things are going to happen. Yeah. And you can have the best press kit in the world and all the whatever and bells and whistles. But if you can't play or if you don't have that, you know, if you don't have a long time welcome to all these people in your life that can help shape that, then it doesn't really make a lot of difference. Again, it could, it could be any of those sources. You know, again, it's all about stories. So you, you just collect stories along the way, and people will, you never know. A guy said something to me once at a cabinet store that I'll never forget. You know, really. I mean, he, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I was there with my father in law, and it was just like we got back to the car, and we're just like, wow, that's about, that's about as much wisdom as you never need. So, you know, or I was sitting next to a pilot on an airplane, I mean, a, a guy on an airplane a few years ago, Eddie Gomez and I were flying somewhere, and sitting next to this guy, and he was worked on race cars, and he was talking about race, race, and he drove, and he said, well, you know, man, he goes, certain people, people, there's people that drive race cars, and then there are race car drivers. You dig? I mean, you know, there's people that do this, and then there's people that really do it. Yeah. You know, that really the people that we know about, usually those people are the ones that are, are the ones that have broken the rules a little bit and have not been afraid to try something different and not adhere, you know. So there's like the saying that Eleanor Roosevelt said is that ladies that behave rarely make history. So, you know, we can apply that to everything. I'm like, wow, you, if you always follow. So that's why, you know, 
with life, I, you know, especially with what's happened, you know, these are my wife and everything. I, I, I'm not holding back, you know, doing all the projects that I want to do. I'm, I'm, you know, we're taking these chances with these movies at the, you know, trying these out on this tour. You're just, you know, going to go for it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me ask you this. I'm going to go back to your early years. Were there any albums that you had growing up that really had a profound influence on you that really kind of affected your jazz brain? Oh, by all means. Uh, Working and steaming, Miles Davis Quintet. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, Live at the Percy and Ahmad Jamal. Uh, it might as well be Swing, Sinatra and Basie. I, my brother, got, my, I was really fortunate. My brother got me this record set. I'm just looking, staring at it right now um, up on the, uh, on the shelf. It's uh, called The Drums, and it was a set put out by ABC Impulse Records. And it was sort of an overview of things that were on Impulse, but they got it. So it was Baby Dodds at that point all the way to Barry Allshoe. So it was, I was very fortunate to get that because I was checking out, you know, Danny Richmond on there and Sid Catlett and Philly Joe Jones and Louis Belson and Buddy and Chico Hamilton. But then I was hearing music that I, as a teenager, young teenager, would have never maybe experienced. So there was, some, there was Albert Eiler on there and there was some, you know, Archie Shep and, and, you know, Keith Jarrett with Paul Motion. And so I just thought, but this is what a jazz drummer did. So I was listening to all this stuff sort of simultaneously, plus the pop music of the day that I was really, you know, I was sort of more into edgier pop music at that point. And so I, it all sort of, there there again, it all sort of shapes, you know, I mean, Talking Head 77 is a very important record to me, you know, um, Message, to, uh, um, uh, The Specials, you know, um, a, a lot of funk records and R&B records, Parliament records, you know, you're know, you you're shaped by a lot of different uh and, and and what you you know you become you, in Chris Lightcap's quote is you are who you've listened to, so you know you listen to a lot of a broad range of music. You know George Jones. I mean for me is important, and and Billie Holiday and George Jones and Hank Williams. I mean I just sort of always thought about how it you know how it really reached me. So I was really intrigued by the music that was a little less of. I didn't know it was not normal. I just thought that's what we did. So I was it was intrigued by it also. So yeah, it was you know very important. And then you know at Wichita State, I had a a person who was very very important. You know is what J C Combs, who's from you know teaches taught at Wichita State, was my professor. We're we're still in contact. We speak at least once a week or you know three times a month. And he he was just if not the most creative person I've ever been around. And 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 also an impresario spirit that that really forever will be a part of who I am. You know like. You know, build it and they will come. If you present it in a in creative way, an imagination, imaginative way, um, people will, you know, they will check it out. So he, he was in, he was inspired. So we did crazy pieces down there with percussion and professional wrestlers and cloggers and pinball machines and all kinds of great stuff. So I always just tell my students and my philosophy is if it's legal, the answer is yes. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. That's cool. So let me ask you this. Uh, speaking of all of these acts and kind of, uh, nostalgia. If you could go back in time and see a show, what would you see and where would you go? That's that. That was a little easier. Duke Ellington Orchestra, fifties, um, sixties. You know. Yeah. This, you know, Sam Woodyard, Cat Anderson. Oh man, one night that. Anything where Papa Joe Jones was playing. You know, I mean, to me, you know, any, you know, to be on that set of of. You know that the television show with Billy Holiday and Lester Young and Joe Jones to see Joe Jones with those peers, you know that era of Joe Jones. You know, there's, there's that really great uh, video of of Caravan where he plays that amazing drum solo with Roy Eldridge and Coleman Hawkins. I mean, any of those guys. That to me, that era of guys. Uh, first of all, they were truly pioneers that bridged a lot of gaps. They bridged the gap between the swing era and bebop modern, really modern playing, and so. There to me, and they were really courageous, and they were really, they had to be, I mean, Coleman Hawkins was one of the most open-minded musicians. So, you know, that era of people to me really, sets, that set the bar kind of high. And I think as far as the, my instrument, I think uh, Jonathan Joe Jones, you know, Papa Joe Jones, we were referred to him as, um, to me, is the benchmark of just creativity, uh, imagination, unbelievable musicianship, unbelievable intelligence, unbelievable entertainment, you know, all of it, all of it put together. So th it, to see him, with, especially with peers, you know, would just be, I, if I could go back 
that'd be great. And then Duke Ellington at any era, but especially for me, that sort of era, you know, I, I, just to hear that music and experience his aura, I think would just be fantastic. Louis yeah. Armstrong also, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, but to me, I could, I, I could, yeah. Ben Webster yeah. to hear Joe Jones with, you know, with Ben Webster someplace. Ah, oh, man, you know, what yeah. that society, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, those guys really took chances. Yeah. Sonically and and um uh, and as much as I'm you know, as much as I'm into bebop I mean the, also to experience Charlie Parker's sound live would be really great. But I mean these guys sort of the the the, the, the to me the really uh era that I'm really drawn to, at least even with as I get older still, is that those what I call the the gap bridgers, you know, the people that were active in the swing areas and then made that transition to, to more of a modern sounding horizontal groove feeling, you know, and, and, uh, man, that would be great. Yeah. Really great that would be. That out. Well, yeah. and that's, that's kind of the reason I'm asking, you know, being here in Kansas city and going down on 18 and finally seeing kind of these old places where it's just, you know, Parker was down there, all of these guys, basically, I mean, that would have just been spectacular, but let me ask you this. Why do you love jazz? I love it because, because of the teamwork. I love the offering and receiving that's going on simultaneously. I think that, to me, is what really draws me. I mean, improvising, we're improvising, but sometimes we're not. You know, I mean, when, but it's just how but that central energy that's there, you know, that's, that's there and the freedom that's there, and, but also the respect. So, you, you know, there's, there's the teamwork, and there, but the teamwork, you have freedom and you have respect and you have regard, you know, and, and, and love and trust of everybody. That to me is really, if you if you look at the Hot Five or if you look at Dave Douglas's quintet, you know now the thing that really draws them together is the band, the teamwork, you know, of of how they play together, and I, I think that's what draws them together. There's there's that in all kinds of music. I'm not saying that that doesn't present in anything, but the aspect of the of of the improvisational, I mean, the freedom aspect of it, of sharing that sound in the moment. Is, is really gets me. So what I look for is really great bands. You know, yeah. I mean, so that's why Duke. I said Duke Ellington's band or that particular band. You know, with Joe Jones and 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 Lester. And, you know, those kind of cats would be you know great. I mean, it'd be great to hear Miles's quit. I mean, any any band, great band, I would love to hear. But that to me is what really draws me draws me to it. Uh, I mean, yeah. rhythm swing is. Is is a very strong factor in that, but that's shared too. That's that doesn't come without the teamwork. So, I think the thing that thrills me most about music is that ability for us to, like my father-in-law said to me one time. He said, "Matt, I think it's just great that you guys can get up there, or you as a team can get up there and just make things up." And yeah. you know, I, we don't think about that as we do it all the time, but it is pretty amazing that we yeah, we can get up there and just do that. And, and I can go play jazz with great soloists. People playing, you know, and not be, you know, satisfied. But wow, when you play a song together and you feel, you feel the sound, you feel the spaces, you feel the the song. You know, you're really people that really play the song. Wow, there's nothing like it. There's really yeah. nothing like it. Yeah. Let me ask you this: You've had a long, fruitful career up to this point. You're you're far from being over. But when you think about your life and what you've done for jazz, what are you happiest about? That I've allowed. Yeah, I've allowed. I mean, I've allowed people to, you know, sound good. You know, I mean, I think that's the thing. You know, I mean, I've gotten to record, you know. I mean, I've been, I've gotten to play on, you know, I don't know, 350 records of Sideman, made my own, play, you know, numerous concerts. That, that, wow, you can walk away and go like, wow. You know, even though I played like a little place in my town, you know, near my town last night, you know, a little gig, six to nine, a little place. Knowing that I walked away, that this trombone player said, man, this felt really great. It was really easy to play. That to me is like that's what it's all about. Yeah. You know, if I can walk away knowing that I was that I helped the teamwork happen, then I know I did my job. You know, yeah. I don't think I'm an innovator. I don't. I don't know. Maybe I brought the humor, some humor or some. I'm happy that people now are sort of seeing that the music can be social and it can be joyous. And I, if I had anything to do with that, I'm happy. But for me, the aspect that wow, that I can through my craft and through my uh, vibe, you know, through my uh, presence that I can welcome that, then I really feel like I've done something. So, you know, cool. one that I think about is um, uh, on 60 Minutes years ago, uh, one of those guys was on the bus with 
with Mr. Basie. So they asked him the same question. What would you like to be known for? Him? And he paused and he looked and he said that that Count Basie was a really nice guy. Cool. And, you know, That's there's cool. another one of those moments where, you know, and so hopefully that, too, that, wow, that, you know, that, that you know, was a good citizen for the music, but that, that I allowed, you know, whatever it was, whether it was free, whether it was swinging, whether it was happy, whether it's comical, whether it's sad music, you know, you 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 sought you you provide whatever it needs to support that. So if I if I've done that, then I feel like I've done something. Perfect. And hopefully help some new you know help young musicians you know which I know that I'm I I have that feeling I see that you know I see that. You know, constantly when I see these, you know, these young guys that are out there now making really leaving a mark, you know, that I had something to do with that. So um, that's a nice feeling, too. Cool. Hey, man, thank you again for your time being candid with me. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Matt for his music and his passion. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things neon jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.